I was in my past when I went to the women's retreat, uh, I was asked to preach and all of us, there were several of us preaching on the bride of Christ. And that's another thing that really kind of jarred me into thinking, because I was into scripture and also reading more about the history and what had happened and, and kind of the language and everything. And I'm realizing um, how God was trying to speak through the means that were already established to let them know what he's doing for them, you know, for sending Christ and the analogies. Well, then there was the one woman who, you know, it was so funny. There's the one woman who did the warring bride with the combat boots and she had, she had the gown and she had a sword and she had a helmet and she was, you know, I don't remember what she said, except she worked up the crowd. Everybody just thought she was they were on their feet. They were stomping on the devil. You know, they were hooting and hollering and doing everything. And I remember standing there thinking, that's so bizarre because it's not about us and what we do. You know, it's about Jesus Christ and what he did for us and what he paid for us. You know, he's paid his life for us. What, what is what is worrisome is, yeah, after she spoke and everything, I had like two women come up to me and say, well, you know, scripture. And they left and everybody was like, oh, you were great. It was all about her. And I thought that's so, so um, plain to see now, you know, kind of coming out of that movement and still being a part and a, a participant. And it made me so sad because it showed what the emphasis was. You know, it was um, the emotional high it was what I could, it was self-centered again. It was what I can do. And Hi there, and welcome to the Love Sick Scribe podcast, where we talk about biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the word and loving the one who is the word, Jesus Christ. I am Dawn Hill, and I am the Love Sick Scribe. All right. Well, hey, everybody. Thanks for joining me today on this episode of the Love Six Scribe podcast. I'm really excited to have this discussion today, and I hope that you find it edifying and even challenging as we look at a topic that is very prominent in this movement about the bride of Christ. And uh, we see this particularly in some circles of the charismatic movement, not all, but in some areas, and especially when you get into the hyper charismatic and new apostolic reformation, you start to see a focus on the bride of Christ and the intimacy with Christ, and, and it's not in the intimacy that's, that's in a biblical way. And unfortunately, I have some, some experience with, with this and, and had journal entries that, that dabbled in this, uh, sad to say. Um, but I'm thankful that God um, granted grace and repentance in this to help me have a better understanding. We, we can see in this, when we look in this movement, that they're, um, the bride in context in, in these types of circles, that there's a different apparel. Um, accessories that are put on the bride, such as combat boots. I'm sure some of you are familiar with that in some of these presentations. We'll talk a little bit about that today. And there's also the language that crosses into the erotic slash sensual uh, physical intimacy leading to a focus on the bedroom chamber. And uh, we're going to talk about why that's problematic and why we need to understand scripture. So I am joined today by Paulette Kozar, and she is a, a good friend of mine now and a uh, sister in Christ. And so I'm really excited to have her on. So Paulette, thank you so much for coming on here today. Hey, thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited, Dawn. I get to, I get to be with you and experience one of your podcasts, which is actually a video. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I so love it. For those that may not be familiar with you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your family? Sure. Um, most of you would know me because of my husband, Steve Kozar, who um, started the Messed Up Church. Um, he started blogging. Um, we experienced, unfortunately, about 10 to 12 years ago, um, we were in a charismatic church and experienced our kids falling away and saw their friends falling away and saw things that just didn't come to pass. And my husband started getting convicted and looking at scripture saying, well, what is what happened here? Why does that sound wrong? And I remember he was very obsessed with that. And he would talk and he works at home because he's an artist. He's a full-time artist. So he would, I'd come home from work and that's all he'd talk about all the time, all the time, all the time. What's going on? I'm like, you know, you need to talk to somebody else. <laughs> I said, you need to write about it or something. And he's like, what do you mean? I said, I think people blog or do something online. Cause he's like, I'm not a good writer. I said, you are a good writer. I said, just find something online and do it. I said, maybe you'll help other people. <laughs> I just flippantly said that because I was just so like over it. <laughs> I mean, what he was saying was true, but I, you know, I, I was with it with him, you know, I'm like, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. You're preaching in the choir. Yes. I don't understand it either. You know, 
anyway, so then he started blogging. Then he connected with Chris Roseboro and Amy Spreeman and the rest of the group and, and Brandon. And um, he started doing YouTube videos. And then he wanted to include me, which I didn't want to get myself into. <laughs> sure, honey, I'll do that. <laughs> so here I am. So yes, my husband is a full-time painter. He has been. We've been married. It'll be 39 years this year. Uh, we started dating in high school. We've known each other since kindergarten. It's kind of crazy. Our older sisters were friends growing up. We have three children. Um, they'll all be bumping up a year, but they're 33, 32, and 28, and not in the home. So, um, and two dogs that you'll see on our show, which is, what is it called again? <laughs> Hit the bar. That's it. Hit the bar. I'm, I'm, I'm going to plug your show for you. Hit the bar. So <laughs> anyway, so that's, and I do work full time and I'm an inside sales rep. So I'm able to work in home now, which is a very, it's a huge blessing. So I'm not traveling all the time. So that's a little bit about me. Well, I'm really glad that, like I said, I'm glad that you're on here and Thank we had you. actually, we're going to dive right into this because we had recently Good. had a conversation um, about a week ago. I kind yeah, of sprung right. this through our conversation. I, I sprung this on Paulette and said, Hey, we should do a podcast about this because <laughs> like, such a, it was such a good discussion, be, and I think it what started it was um, where I had shared that clip of Bobby Connor talking mm -hmm. about, you know, Jesus telling him about he didn't understand, uh, didn't know anything about kissing, and then led him to Song of Songs, and it just seemed kind of icky, honestly, mm -hmm. hearing, no offense, but hearing an older man say these types of things, and it really didn't go any further than that. He was just inserting this type of teaching and this extra biblical revelation and we started talking about how in this movement that it's really prevalent to have this type of mindset and there is a misunderstanding um, misinterpretation of the bride of christ and then it's made into this like jesus is your boyfriend type mentality and then the message becomes ultimately man-centered and not christ-centered because then it begins to to morph into this well, you know, we're a warrior bride. And like I said, we'll talk about that, but, um, and it's not going to be a deep dive today. So um, we're, we're not going to be expositing scripture <laughs> or anything <laughs> like that. We, we want to basically, as I normally do on these episodes, touch on things briefly and then encourage you to do your own Bible study. Um, ask your pastor questions so that, and, and get your hands on some good uh, material that's going to help you understand the Bible better in a proper context. So with that, we're going to hear from a few leaders in this movement regarding this topic that, that you'll hear, and you may recognize some of them. And all of a sudden, I see this beautiful bride, but to my shock in the dream, she has commando boots on. And all of a sudden in this dream, I'm like, this is not an ordinary bride. This is the warrior bride. And I knew in the dream that the warrior bride represented God's end time church. And I hear the voice of God in the dream beckon this bride to sit down at this long table. And in the dream, a messenger comes to her and I see, I see this scroll in the dream. And in the dream, I see on the scroll this phrase, fivefold warfare. The message of eternity is the triune God includes you into the essence of the Trinity. God has made room for the bride. It's a mystery. I, I can't explain it. I, I'm seeing it like the grapes of Eskel from afar. I'm seeing it like through a telescope that's far, far away. But I see the mystery. And I, and I can but only speak what I see. And that the Trinity is making room for you and me. That the Lord is in a, a glorious fashion preparing a church, a bride, to rule and reign with him. Now, if you're going to rule and reign with the Son of God, that kind of makes you special. <laughs> that, that makes you somebody. And if we'll stop trying to find our identity in, in the church ladder of success and, and what people can give to us, because if people give it to us, they can withdraw it from us. But when God gives you something, it will be. His gifts are without repentance. He's not going to pull it back. And if we put our identity in who he has made us, that we will shine as bright as the sun, fair as the moon. We are the leaning upon our beloved bride. We lean into him for strength. We lean into him for our identity. As we leaned into him for salvation, we can lean into him for everything we need. And leaning means you're not capable. <laughs> you know, you've got to lean. You have to literally rest yourself in his bosom. 
And the eternal realm is about to be opened up to the church like never before. And I, behold, a mystery is coming. And the mystery is this, that you are not going to the New Jerusalem. You are going to be the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem is not where you're going. You're going if you're going there, you're going to miss it because it's coming here. John saw the New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven to the earth. And this city looked like a something prepared for her something. Fill in those blanks for me, ladies and gentlemen. This city looked like a a bride. So which is it? A city or a bride? Yes. Last night, I heard the voice of the Lord speaking over the people these two words, marry me. I felt in my heart he wanted to propose to his people for a fresh giving of themselves over to him. A couple of points that I talked about was the wonderful phrase that is used in weddings, forsaking all others, keeping only to thee. This is the essence of marry me. Will you forsake everything and everybody else and keep only to me? That's the bride. This is the difference between those that are just part of the church and those that are the bride of Christ. This kind of love is the love that Jesus longs for. This is what he died to get from you. All of your love, your attention, your devotion. He is taken with you and nothing moves his heart more than when you're taken with him. One of my so, friends. There's several people that we could talk about today. And um, in light of the things even going on at IHOP, sad to say, I, I wanted to actually talk about Brian Simmons. And many of you may be familiar with Brian Simmons. He has been an integral leader in this movement by introducing the Passion Translation, which is not a translation. Uh, I would actually, if you need some help understanding what this is, I would really suggest that you go to Mike Winger's channel, uh, Bible Thinker, and he has done extensive work on this. He's had the Passion Project that he, he has hired biblical scholars to look at certain books of the Bible that they are um, skilled in, and they've reviewed the Passion Translation's version of those. And I'll put the link in the description below, but his work was, was integral for me because I was being considered for writing Bible studies for the Passion Translation. Um, and thankfully, I saw these videos that Mike did and it helped me to understand. And then of course they never contacted me again. So it kind of fell through, which that that's fine. I think that was God's grace, honestly, <laughs> working in that situation. But at any, at any rate, um, if you look up Simmons, you're going to find numerous videos um, that from him discussing weaving into his messages about being the bride of Christ. He wrote a book about um, the song of Solomon years ago called the sacred, sacred journey or sacred romance. Um, and he talks a lot about intimacy with Christ. But here is a clip to demonstrate Brian Simmons talking about these very things. He's within us. The Revelation 12 virgin bride will give birth to a man-child company, a corporate expression. One has become many. The seed has now fallen in the ground and died, but is now bearing many seeds. There's a many-seeded Christ. He will prolong his days and take pleasure in what he sees. Isaiah 53 says that, that he will see his seed and prolong his days. We are extending the ministry of Jesus throughout the nations. We are carrying his life and his nature and his DNA wherever we go. We are prolonging his days, the Acts 29 company. We are expressing the Christ wherever we go. And as the corporate maturity uh, continues and we rise to be the holy temple under the Lord, there will be that under the apple tree conception. And the Christ we long for will be seen in a corporate way. There's a coming glory. So he said Isaiah 53? Yes, Isaiah you know what? 53. I'm looking at Isaiah 53, and it's all about the suffering servant. It's about yeah. Jesus suffering on the cross. I don't understand that. <laughs> well, like I should, right? <laughs> I yeah. mean, it's just, it's. You want me to read it? Yeah. Okay. Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, like a root out of dry ground. He 
had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chast chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity, iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people, and they made his grave with wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. Whose days are going to be prolonged? You know, it's not our seed. I mean, come on. Um, and that, and that's what he was focusing on. Yes, that, he was. That very verse right there was what he was focusing on to say this whole man-child company is going to come forth and that you're going to have Jesus's DNA, which like, you know, no, you don't get Jesus's DNA. That's No. And then, it, and then it keeps just going about Jesus. The will of the Lord shall prosper his hand out of the anguish of his soul. He shall see and be satisfied by his knowledge. Shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. Um, that's called imputed righteousness of Christ, which is yes. why now we're heirs and children of God. And he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with many, and he shall divide the spoil with strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. End of chapter. You can hear that whole intimacy type talk. He's talking about the under the apple tree conception and what the <laughs> Even, I mean, if he's saying this is even. this is the chapter and I'm going to read, you know, this is what it says in the Bible. Okay, yeah. people, you really need to take out your Bible. You really, mm -hmm. if you're serious about your spiritual well-being and your spiritual health, always look into context. Always say, okay, this is the chapter and verse, but what's around that one verse? Let's look at the whole thing. Yeah. You know, is it prescriptive, like Pastor Chris says, Chris Roseborough, or is it descriptive? And a lot of this in, in scripture is descriptive because that's how God, you know, speaks to his children. He created us a certain way and has set things up in a way that he can speak to us because he created it like a man and a woman in marriage. So I'm sorry, go ahead. And Isaiah 53 is that. beautiful. It's beautiful in and of itself to read. This is all about Christ, Christ right. being Christ centered. And again, that's the thing is that when you have this type of message about the bride of Christ, you have to be willing to ask the question, who is actually being exalted here? Yes. Who's the focus? I mean, and who's the savior? Because right. it sounds like the bride is. She's strapping on combat boots, according yeah. to Jeremiah Johnson and other people. Yes. She's strapping on combat boots. And she's bride. Yeah. Yep. And we don't see anything in scripture that no. helps us to, to draw conclusions to that picture it's it's right. something that appeals to people's senses i'm strong flesh, i'm flesh. powerful yes absolutely yes yeah it's an appeal to to your own desires and and um and flesh and honestly sinful and fleshly yes. desires is what it yes. appeals to now i know when i was listening to some clips that simmons um had mentioned that he was influenced by mike bickle in his understanding of this topic um, concerning Song of Solomon. Like so many, I had avoided that. Uh, I skipped over that and genealogies and Leviticus. I confess, <laughs> as I read through the Bible, I, I just, I missed some. And Song of Songs was eight chapters that I virtually skipped over because it was just gobbledygook. It didn't make any sense to me. But like so many in the early 90s, Mike Bickle began to teach on the Song of Songs and right. it kind of piqued my interest. And I decided to dive into the book myself. I bought commentaries, I did research. And then I wrote a book called The Journey of the Bride 
that it, it sold, I don't know, 10,000 copies. It was okay. But uh, it really launched me into this passion to know God intimately. And I have to say, Peter, you know, to admit that I'm a bride, you know, <laughs> that to jump that masculine hurdle right. of, of touching the feminine part of our being, mm -hmm. that I want to yield myself to God. Mm -hmm. And if it means that intimate place where I'm vulnerable and I'm undone and I, I don't have answers and I, I, I'm not trying to compose myself, then so be it. Right. And that I joyfully, gleefully dove into the revelation of the Song of Songs and I saw it unfold in front of me. I honestly had so many encounters with the Holy Spirit that he taught me through that book. And I knew when I started the Passion Translation that that would be the first book mm -hmm. I wanted to tackle. And uh, so we did it. But yeah, I love And he also said too in that interview that he had avoided um, reading Song of Solomon and studying it for years. Uh, but then after reading books from Bickle and others, he decided to take another look at it. And then that's when he began to become enamored with it. And it was, he actually tells people, Paulette, in the same interview that he says, I know a lot of people tell you to go to the Gospels to understand Jesus. But he said, I think you need to go to Song of Solomon first. You know, we used to tell everybody to start reading the book of John. Right. When you come to faith, start with John. I think we need to switch that and tell every new believer, start with the heart of the Bible, which is the Song of Songs. And the arteries go out into the Gospels, Pauline theology, and into the Old Testament histories. But the heartbeat of heaven is divine romance that Jesus is the king, we are the Shulamite. Right. Solomon and Shulamite is the same Hebrew root word, one mm. masculine, one feminine. Mm. We are one with Jesus Christ. Wow. And when you start there, then the Gospels will make more sense, Paul's teaching, etc. Well, that, that Wow. I Why heard did Paul him. tell everybody that? Yeah. Paul, he tells them. The Apostle yeah. Paul. Yeah. And then to go to the Gospels after Song of Solomon so that That's they can beautiful. have a better understanding. So um, I, I wanted to share an example real quick. Sure. I, I'm, not, I'm not proud of this, but I, I was telling you, I have my, my old edition of the Passion Translation, and this was before Genesis and Isaiah was, I can't use the word translated because it's not a translation, but um, I wanted to to we're going to look at some verses today from Brian Simmons and talk about them and, and listen to a couple of, of clips. And then you had done some study that I thought would be really helpful um, and, and shedding some light on some things when you had looked at some resources and such for have it to have a better understanding. But I wanted to read this verse from Song of Solomon, uh, chapter eight, mm -hmm. verse six, out of the Passion Translation. Or the Passion, I'm just going to call it the Passion. Yeah. Yeah, don't um, say <laughs> yeah, it's not. It's not. Mm -mm. So in verse six of Song of Songs, verse six, um, Brian Simmons has said this. Fasten me upon your heart as a seal of fire forevermore. This living, consuming flame will seal you as my prisoner of love. My passion is stronger than the chains of death and the grave, all consuming as the very flashes of fire from the burning heart of God, place this fierce, unrelenting fire over your entire being. Now, one thing that was kind of troubling to me looking at this is that when you look in the footnotes, uh, four, verse six, he says this, um, for the word seal, the ancient Hebrew word for seal can also be translated prison cell. He longs for his bride to be his love prisoner in the prison cell of his eternal love. So where does, so he's actually saying that is part of Hebrew? That is yes. Hebrew. Yes. I would really like to, I actually don't trust that. I, would I don't, really, I'm not I don't a either. Hebrew person, but I should actually really, I, I should look into that because I cannot, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And, and so what he does is he's inserting another belief. Right. In what he's doing um, right. by, by saying this. And it's, uh, again, it's a, cre it's creating this erotic. Yeah type way and then he's allegorizing song of songs and he's right. saying that it's the it's christ and his bride and and he's wanting to read more into it than that's there so that that was one example i wanted to share with that um and and what he states in the footnotes i have a moody commentary so from this moody commentary for example um it says for song of songs in verse uh six of chapter eight it says various images describe the nature and power of love. First, love is like a seal or signet ring. In the ancient world, this was an engraved stone or metal stamp used to prove ownership and indicate the value of a possession. The Shulamite wanted to be her husband's most valuable treasure. Having the seal over his heart, 
the place of his affections, and over his arm, the source of his strength, demonstrated her priority in his life. And at second, love is as strong as death. If love is true, nothing can stop love or change love. Third, uh, third love, described as jealousy, is as severe as Sheol, the place of the dead. In English, jealousy usually has negative connotations, but in Hebrew, it also indicates ardor, zeal, or passion. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, the Lord is jealous for his people. That's in Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. And here, love is depicted as powerful and inescapable because the flame of the Lord himself is the source of love. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we can even that's see... That's excellent, actually. Yeah, that's and, very good. And we can even see that, <clears throat> certainly, we can see that Christ's love for us is stronger than death. Right. That that's encouraging, but this again is taking it beyond what the text is actually saying. That is correct. And he's yeah. adding in new new concepts Revelation. and new beliefs. Yes. Yeah. No, that's that's exactly it. The signet that's you just that's what I found too, which makes sense because when you think about in context, what what does that word mean? What's actually being said, and what did they do back then? You know. Who was he talking to? What was the ritual like? And what would that mean to the people he's speaking with? And all those things are very important when you're reading scripture to keep in mind and not, I used to be one who took all this extra stuff too, because I wasn't moving as, in the, I was moving in the prophetic, but I hadn't gotten so deep into it. Um, but that's what I started doing myself too. It's just, you know, it's got to make sense. Kind of like with that um, amplified Bible that Joyce Meyer always uses. You oh, know, insert yeah. word here. And they give you all the different words you can use. <laughs> yeah. And that's not how that works. No, it <laughs> is not. That one word does not have all those meetings at one time. <laughs> that's not how any of this works. <laughs> Which one do you feel you should need to use here? <laughs> we don't do, do that. You, what, what I, how do I feel today? Which <laughs> word do I want to use out of this list from yeah. the Amplified? Let's yes. see. What am I feeling yes. today? <laughs> <laughs> that's why it's yeah. important to study scripture. It is. Um, it is. And that's not being religious. That's the other thing, too, is that I hear people, I had, just as a side note, I had someone come on my YouTube channel and comment because I was saying, go back to scripture because of the man that was alleging to have an angel feather fall that was right, okay. corkscrewed, which I'm going to be addressing here very <laughs> soon. And this person said, well, you know, you telling people to stay biblical is religious. We're to follow the spirit. And I, so I responded back and I said, well, essentially, the Holy Spirit inspired Scripture. Right. And that's how we know who God is. And for believers, they came to saving faith through the proclamation of the gospel. That's in the Bible. <laughs> we can't walk in God's ways unless we know what the Spirit has revealed. And that's in the Bible. You can't know God without the Bible. So this whole thing of saying um, you're religious, if you say, well, no, that's actually not what Scripture says. I find that problematic because if oh, you're definitely. going to say you're a Christian and then you're going to try to argue with someone and say, well, you're just being religious because you're supposed to be led by the spirit. Well, you're, you're disconnecting the spirit from his word and you can't mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. Amen, sister. You're right. You're absolutely right. Ah. Excellent point. Excellent point. <laughs> so um, I will come back to uh, Ephesians 1 14 in just a minute, because that actually ties in with song of Solomon. But the, here's another clip that I wanted to share with you all and to also hear Paulette's thoughts on uh, from Brian Simmons. He oh is um, expounding on John chapter 19, verse 30. Let's see what he has to say about Jesus saying from the cross, it is finished. The last teaching before he offered himself for us, a bride and a bridegroom. The last verse in the Bible, spirit and the bride. I'll leave you with this mystery. I saved the best for last. Do you remember homonym? Remember homonym? Jesus did not speak Greek on the cross. The last words of Jesus were not tetelestoi, which is Greek for finished. That was not the last word Jesus spoke because he spoke Galilean Aramaic. The language Jesus spoke on the cross was his heart language. It's debatable whether he or even a majority of his disciples could speak Greek. That's for another debate. But we know for sure that Jesus spoke Aramaic. Biblical Hebrew had died out from the captivity onward till about 200 uh, AD before Hebrew was coming back. They did not speak Hebrew. They spoke Aramaic. So the last word Jesus spoke was kala, 
Kala. Kala. Kala is a homonym. It means finished. Do not leave here and say Brian took that truth away from you because I'm not doing that at all. It is finished. Praise Alula. It's finished. Aren't you glad? But what if for 2,000 years the church has been deprived of another nuance of that last word Jesus spoke? Kala. When you come to Israel with me, sweetheart, you'll love it, by the way. We'll stop anybody on the street speaking Hebrew and say, hey, yo, what does kala mean? Oh, he'll make fun of you. He'll say, Every, everybody knows what kala means. The last word Jesus spoke. Bride! Bride! Yeah, he finished it, but for who? Then he gave birth to her. Blood and water. Spilled from his womb. And he gave birth to the heavenly Eve. Yeah. How can he be an everlasting father and not have sons and daughters? He gave birth to his bride at the cross. Kala. Bride. Come tomorrow. I'll take you deeper than you've ever been before. Deep enough to swim in. Unbelievable. Yeah. It was very disturbing to listen. Disturbing. The first time I heard him say that when I was listening to these clips. Yeah. And I heard him say that and I thought, first of all, he was appealing to for 2000 years that the church was missing this revelation. Right. Which that's that's ridiculous in and of itself to to make a claim because then the church couldn't have been being built for 2000 years. Right. But then to, that's he's heretical. A, it's it's Gnosticism yeah, right there. Exactly. Then he's appealing to the fact of this homonymic thing. So he's trying to basically take the Hebrew word kala and say that it can be inserted and it also means finished, just like the Greek word tetelestai means finished. But what's very telling, and this is what I want, this is why I wanted to bring this one up, mm -hmm. was because he keeps saying, well, Jesus spoke Aramaic. Jesus spoke Aramaic. Okay, well, yeah, he did. So why in the Gospels did, um, did they make a point when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They put that in Aramaic, but they didn't put it as finished in Aramaic. And that was one of the first thoughts that came to my mind of, and he's trying to insert something. And again, this whole man-centered, woman-centered yeah. message, who's the last one, bride, and instead of saying it is finished, which means that take that diminishes the gospel, Paulette. That absolutely does. It now diminishes. It. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're diminishing what Christ did. Absolutely. And saying that's not sufficient enough right. for 2,000 years for the church to know this, that right. what the, the payment that he made, the atonement that he made on the cross taking upon himself the full cup of the wrath of God for our sin that we did that the the pen the punishment that we deserved right you're you're stripping that away and then you're saying that he said the bride and then this whole stuff about that he was that that the bride was born from his Jesus didn't have a womb okay That's right we're Absolutely. having some problems here with with anatomy <laughs> <laughs> he did right. not have a womb no matter how you want to phrase that. Yeah. And he was already dead when the spear pierced his side. Right. So you're, you're going to stand on that and say that the church was birthed in that moment. Right. When the church was actually, it came to f fulfillment at Pentecost. I mean, <laughs> this see, is and nuts. It is. But again, coming from that background, that mindset is, well, I know what he meant. Yes. Because if Jesus didn't die on the cross, the church wouldn't have been birthed. Right. I'm just saying, you know, that's, that's the, that would be my past thinking, which will, I know. Yes. And isn't that, and isn't that significant because Christ's death is significant, Yes. but you don't, what he's doing, he's taking a tiny bit of truth and he's twisting the heck out of it to add in his own man centered and elevating man and elevating new words, which is heretical, which Paul says, if anyone adds to this gospel, let them be accursed. He says that twice, which means damned. Paul says, let them be damned, you know, and that, that, that's harsh. That's big. And I guess they don't read that part of the scripture. I mean, it's like, 
Yeah. It's sad. It is so sad because the movement is so big. Um, and these, and this is the author of the passion book, right? Yep. You're not going to say translation just so everyone knows. Yes. He, he is oh, the, the lead person oh. that, that does this and he's changing scripture yeah, is what exactly. he's doing. He's exactly. changing God's word. Yep. Um, and I think for those that would read the Passion Translation, you need to be aware that he has been called out by Holly Pivick and others numerous times in past trans past ver versions that he's yeah. done. And he's uh, revised them without addressing when he's been called out. So he'll make uh, revisions, but then he has claimed before that Jesus breathed on him and told him oh. to do this, that he is to do this to reveal the heart of God. And um, I, honestly, I think, again, it's, it's speaking to um, a belief of insufficiency in Scripture. If you believe that God's heart um, and his, the truth of what, who God is has not been revealed for 2,000 years, and then you need to come along and insert these additional— Educate everybody. Yeah, then there's something seriously wrong. And, you know, I'm sure we could think of other people such as Joseph oh, Smith and others that absolutely. other people have mentioned this that have uh, appealed to personal experiences and it's led to cults <clears throat> being formed and false right. religions being formed. And it's, right. it's deceptive. And, and I think that's why it's important to bring this stuff up because it's, it's not honoring God. I mean, no. I, I was just blown away by that. that clip. <laughs> you need to, and if you read the passion translation, or if you think we're being nitpicky, um, or religious or what have you, you do need to understand the weight of those words. And then you have to look at yourself and say, what do I believe? What do I believe? And I had had a friend of mine who said, well, there's so many translations. How do you know which one's really true? You know, and it's like, well, you start digging and learning. You know, if you want to, there are Bibles out there that have the Greek and the Hebrew and you, and it has the literal English right alongside of it. So if you're so worried that you're not getting the true Bible, get that, you know, and start reading that. But if God is who he says he is and he created the universe, that's pretty big. He does things and he gave us something and he, and, and he cherished his word and has guarded it for all of these years. What about all those people the last 2000 years who didn't get it right because of what Brian Simmons said? Now what happened to them? They missed it. You know, the apostles missed it. The apostles should have known, but they didn't. Where are they? Because they don't know the true bride of Christ. You know, it's just craziness. It's, and so then that's where you say, okay, is, is, do I believe scripture sufficient? Do I believe it is um, written through the inspiration of the Holy spirit through men? Do I believe Jesus Christ is the son of God? Do I believe in the truth? I mean, you have to really strip it down. Okay. I mean, that's what Steve and I did. And that's a lot. What I did was like, okay, what do I believe? There's so many people saying so many things out there. And that's a very good place to be because that allows the Holy spirit to start showing you and convicting you through scripture. You know what the truth is because Jesus said, I am the way I am the truth and I am the life. He is the truth. So if you are a follower of Christ, he, he will guide you in truth through his Holy Spirit. So it's so important to know it. There's one more that we're going to look at before we actually go, go look at scripture in context <laughs> and talk about what it means to be the bride of Christ. We're going to be listening to Brian Simmons talk about Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, and how he puts it in the Passion Version. Oh and so you can hear this for yourself, and we'll talk a little bit about it, and then we're going to move on. Okay. That's what I was going to say. You can feel the fingerprints of the Song of Solomon on Philippians and Ephesians and, you know, that place where it says that he's been given, the Holy Spirit's been given as a down payment, and you compare it to a wedding ring, you know, the yep. promise of what will come. And I had never seen that picture. It's such a beautiful illustration of the, it's a covenant. Where, like, I give the, the ring, but we're not married. Merely more of an engagement <laughs> ring, not a wedding ring, an engagement ring. It's a sign of the covenant and, and the promise of what's to come. It's a, yeah. it's a brilliant analogy. Yeah, just think of if the Holy Spirit, gifts, fruit, wisdom, power, is the down payment, the engagement ring, what is the wedding, <laughs> what is the marriage going to be like, right. the union, where two mm. become one. It's not right. good for the Son of Man to be alone. Mm. So we're going to be joined to Him. And the, the Holy Spirit is that, that, that payment, the down payment, the pledge, the engagement ring, arabon in the, in the Greek. 
and it is used in Greece today as engagement rings. So, so now I'm going to read the passion, the passion versions, uh, Ephesians chapter one, verse 14. And I want you to hear the difference between this and the ESV. Ryan Simmons says, he is given to us like an engagement ring is given to a bride as the first installment of what's coming. He is our hope promise of a future inheritance, which seals us until we have all of redemption's promises and experience complete freedom for all the supreme glory and honor of God. Now I want you to notice what the ESV says and just the mere fact that of the length of it compared to the passion. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, the ESV says, Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory? He's added so many words, and then he's making this appeal of the Holy Spirit is the engagement ring given to a bride as the first installment of what's coming. So, again, a little bit of truth in there, right? Because according to customs back in those days there was the betrothal process where the fathers decided who was going to marry who and the money the mohar money typically was given to the father and then a gift was given to the woman who was going to be the bride the groom not yet the groom the betrothed, he would go back to his father's house and prepare a room for them, but she would know, not know when he was coming back, but she knew he was coming back because of the gift that he gave her. So that gave her encouragement and that reassured her that he was going to come back. There was no rings back then, from my understanding and my, my studying. Um, that came later, um, more during the Roman period. A lot of our... Um, Things that we do with rings. Um, the signet ring was popular, like you were reading back then about that ring. Signet ring would have sealed something. Um, they did talk about possibly there was a ring that she would wear on her third finger, possibly would be one of the gifts, um, but not necessarily. You know, the whole idea, though, is that God did give us the Holy Spirit. He is preparing us, and we don't know when He's going to come back. You know, so again, God was speaking to them in the language that they understood, I think. So when, when Christ came and then he left and he said, when I leave, I'm going to go prepare a place for you, but I'm sending you some, a comforter. So he said, I'm sending you something. And the gifts that we have are given to us by God that we serve him with, you know, it's not, it's, it's not this mushy feeling ooey gooey thing that he's talking about. It's, it's what, it's the imputed righteousness of Christ. It is what he, what the Holy Spirit empowers us to be. And we can serve him because of what he is doing within us and the sanctification that's happening. So again, yeah, he left us the Holy Spirit. And yes, it's to seal us, but it's not what he's saying. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing with, with this too is it, Looking in even Ephesians 1 14, um, this is to point us to the, our eternal state yes. with Christ, the yes. promise that we have of eternal life. And the Holy Spirit is the guarantee of that. Yes. And that should encourage us that, that it's not, it's not based on anything that we do. And it's not right. based on, um, our merit. It's based on the finished work of Christ on the right. cross. And the fact that he sent the Holy Spirit, it it validates and it affirms that his Christ promise. did. Yes, that Absolutely. he that he is keeping his word. Yes, that he's um, keeping his word. Yeah, yeah, and that there's redemption that we yes. can we can rest in, and that we have the Holy Spirit to to comfort us in that and to encourage us in that, and we have God's word yes. to help us and to encourage us in that. We and also it, have the Lord's Supper and yes. we have the Lord's Prayer. You know, Jesus taught us how to pray. Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. These things are means of grace and his Holy Scripture to say, I got this. I'm giving you this. I'm serving you this. You know, you are saved. You are a child of God because of what I did. And let me serve you with this again. It's not, again, what we do. And, you know, that's the other thing I think in the background is like, well, I love God so much. I better show I better do this or that. And I think then you can look at it like, 
I'm encouraged and I'm instilled to do good things because I can't help myself because of what what Christ has done for me. Am I always like that? No, you know, because I live in this world and we all have sin nature and we're still battling that. Paul talks about that in Romans 8, you know, um, but because and anything that I do that I think is good is still not good, but it is because when God looks at me, he sees Christ. You know, so we look at like, well, that's a good person. How come they're not going to heaven? Well, they don't have the imputedness and righteousness of Christ clothing them because you can't be good enough because of 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 the sin, sinful world we live in. And because of the fallen nature of man, it's just God's ways are different than ours. And his, you know, his measuring stick is we could never attain, which is why he then put paid for it for us. He paid for getting us back to retrieving us. <laughs> so what are your, what are your thoughts then? Um, you know, as far as this whole, uh, vision or perception of the bride of Christ in the, in the combat boots. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it was interesting because, um, I was in my past when I went to the women's retreat, uh, I was asked to preach and all of us, there were several of us preaching on the bride of Christ. And that's another thing that really kind of jarred me into thinking, because I was into scripture and also reading more about the history and what had happened and, and kind of the language and everything. And I'm realizing um, how God was trying to speak through the means that were already established to let them know what he's doing for them, you know, for sending Christ and the analogies. Well, then there was the one woman who, you know, it was so funny. There's the one woman who did the warring bride with the combat boots and she had, she had the gown and she had a sword and she had a helmet and she was, you know, I don't remember what she said, except she worked up the crowd. Everybody just thought she was there on their feet. They were stomping on the devil. You know, they were hooting and hollering and doing everything. And I remember standing there thinking, that's so bizarre because it's not about us and what we do. You know, it's about Jesus Christ and what he did for us and what he paid for us. You know, he's paid his life for us. And um, it again, it, it just concerned me. And again, when, when we were talking about doing this, looking through scripture and even trying to find stuff online that maybe there was some hidden scripture areas that I didn't know about this warring bride, but I didn't see it. I didn't see that the bride should all of a sudden wear combat boots. I don't, maybe I missed something. Did you find anything? <laughs> no, I found nothing. <laughs> Not a thing. Where did that even come from? I mean, really? I mean, I don't even know. I don't know. I, I don't know if it is something that ha occurred in the latter rain. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know where this came from. It's just wrong. Yeah. We don't have to know where it's come from. because it's just, <laughs> We just know it's not biblical. It's so. not chapter and verse time here. <laughs> That's right. You can't find it. So we just need to just not even worry about it at this point. Yeah. And but, I think what, what, is, what is worrisome is, yeah, after she spoke and everything, I had like two women come up to me and say, well, you know, scripture and they left and everybody was like, oh, you were great. It was all about her. And I thought that's so, so um, plain to see now, you know, kind of coming out of that movement and still being a part and a, a participant. And it made me so sad because it showed what the emphasis was. You know, it was um, the emotional high it was what I could, it was self-centered again. It was what I can do. And well, now that we've, we've looked at that <laughs> and uh, we're now ready to, to look at scripture in the right light, I wanted to, um, to get you to share some of the things that you had found in scripture sure. that you felt like that was, was relevant to this discussion. Thank you. So there's several verses there's many verses in scripture that talk about the bride and um, being the church and what Jesus did for her. And the analogies we could go, there was, um, I want to go with Matthew 25, um, chapter one, uh, 46 on, and it talks about the 10 virgins. Um, chapter 25, verse one through 46. I can't read my own typing. <laughs> Um, the 10 virgins, it was interesting because it, it again shows that yes, they don't know when the bridegroom's coming back and to be prepared, you know, and how to be prepared is being in God's word, you know, is, is, uh, serving him is going th through scripture, partaking in the Lord's supper, you know, um, 
And I liked that, you know, we don't know when Jesus is coming back, but we need to be prepared. Um, and then it's in context because then Jesus talks about the other parts of um, preparedness and using other analogies. It wasn't the, it wasn't the virgins anymore. Now he's talking about, um, you know, the parable of the talents and um, that's in verse 14 where it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted them to his properties. Then he goes through that ex explaining what the kingdom of God is. Um, throughout that whole chapter, he's talking about being prepared. And again, it's, it's so important to read it in context and to understand how they're similar, like his analogies are similar. What is the overall theme he's trying to tell us? And so then he he finishes it up by saying at the end in verse 31, so when the son of man comes in his glory and the angels with him, then he will sit on the glorious throne. Behold, before him will be gathered all of the nations and he will separate people from one another. And the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats and he will place on the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed to my father, by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world for I was hungry. And then he goes through all of that and explains about, and then this is also where he says in verse 41, then he will say to those on the left, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For when I was hungry, you gave me no food. And when I was thirsty, you did not give me a drink. When I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. And then they said to the Lord, when, when were you hungry or when were you thirsty? When were you naked? And then he said, truly, I say to you, as you did not do for one of these least of these, you did not do that for me. And then they, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. There's another scripture, which I don't have marked, where he says, you know, well, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do this in your name? Because well, I don't know who you are. You know, we, we did signs. We did wonders. We did miracles. And Jesus does not know them. And that should alert us all as to... Why is that in there? <laughs> yeah. You know? And Matthew 7. And he, yeah. So what was your thoughts on Matthew? Yeah, I, I, that's one of the passages, especially about the, the 10 virgins, it's focused on, again, in this movement. And um, I, I, I like what you were saying, which I think was very helpful. We have to take the whole chapter in the context of that's not the main focus here. Uh, Jesus is giving them these illustrations in order for them to understand what the kingdom of heaven is like. And right. we are to, we're to be prepared as what you were saying. And this is, mm -hmm. this doesn't mean that we have to go into trying to find extra biblical revelation and working ourselves up into a frenzy and, and trying to make sure we hear the voice of God for ourselves and that we, we jump through all these hoops, but this is about, um, staying faithful to God. And we do that by staying in his word, abiding yes. in his word so that we know him and um, that we obey him in his instructions and that we're being led by the spirit and not by our flesh. And that we're understanding that we're being sanctified day by day by the power of the Holy spirit. And I, I really love the fact that one of the scriptures you shared too was in Ephesians five, because um, Ephesians five Mm -hmm. um, Paul touches on the relationship between husbands and wives, and he's showing them the correlation with Christ mm -hmm. and, and the body or the, or the bride essentially. And, um, we know that even in old test, the old Testament, that, that it says that God was the husband of Israel. So we know mm -hmm. that there's that idea there. And I'd like for you to, to share on that. Cause you shared something before we got on here about that, that I thought was really good. But can you can you talk a little bit about Ephesians five so that we can kind of help how this the bride, which I don't to my knowledge the 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 term bride of Christ is not in scripture that that mm -hmm. those words together, mm -hmm. but we do see that there's a correlation here in marriage with with Jesus. We see that in the book of Revelation at the end. Right. So can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, um, I'll try. <laughs> but in if it sounds a little okay, Paul, what do you mean by that? Um, Ephesians 5.24, I will um, I will read that. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. 
25 is husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave up himself for her that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. So we get cleansed baptism and the word. <laughs> it's all how he works and how he serves us. God gives it to us so that he might present the church to himself in splendor. So he does this and he's the one that presents us again. You know, I think, I liked what you said about, you know, we shouldn't, what, what do we have to do? Where's our list, you know, of all the burdens really. And you think about the Pharisees back in Jesus time, they started adding more and more things for the people to do and, and, and extra, extra things. Like we have extra biblical, you know, um, revelation now that now, okay, when do we know it's enough? When do we know we're prepared enough? When do we know that we're okay now? You know, that's more of a burden. We're, Christ came to take that away and he gave us, he gave us his life and he gave us the word. Um, so I love this part in 28, he says in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. And then it goes about, uh, therefore, a man shall leave the father and mother and hold fast to his wife and to become one flesh. This He goes, this, this mystery is profound, and, and I am saying that refers to Christ and the church. So in the best way, Paul's trying to explain how we are connected to Christ, and yet he's also giving commandments to really the husband and wife and how the husband needs to love his wife because back in these days as well, the wives were okay, but they were not cherished like that. Um, Christ came and because of what Jesus did, women were liberated and women were seen it with value now because of what Jesus did. Right. That's important. I had in here that this leads into John three twenty nine, 29. Um, and let me see where that's at here. I have the one who has um, the bride is the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hear him hear hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice therefore the joy of mine is now complete he must increase and mine must decrease now that's john the baptist when he saw jesus and what's really neat too is when you know i'm kind of probably gone off on a tangent but when mary went and saw her aunt who was carrying they were both pregnant when she walked in you know the baby leapt you know, he leaped in the womb. So he knew Jesus was there and he, he is the bridegroom's friend. He's the one that prepared the way. And, and that's another thing that I found in history is that that's what the bridegroom's friend did. He prepared the way he made sure everything was done legally for the bride and the bridegroom, whatever the bridegroom needed. And it just is a beautiful example of, um, of Christ and about God being thorough with his word that it is sufficient. <laughs> yeah. One of the um, things that you touched on uh, with Ephesians too, I've heard, I don't know how many times in in years past in this movement and then in hearing uh, leaders now talk about telling the, the people that are coming to these gatherings, you know, you need to get your, your garment spotless. Christ is coming back right. for a spotless yes. church without, without spot or blemish. And you right. need to get these wrinkles out and you need to get these blemishes out and you, and it's, that that's taking away again, it's taking away from who is the one who cleanses us here. It's Christ who cleanses right. us. He has cleansed us with uh, Ephesians five is very clear. <laughs> and he's the one that has sanctified us and he's cleansed us. He's the one that has purified us. And we uh, can further continue to understand that by what you said, staying in the word. Yes. Right. If you want to understand what it means for holiness and consecration, it's not about, again, your works. It's about obeying what God says to do. Your works don't save you. Um, I've heard a minister say you're not saved by good works, but you're saved for good works. <laughs> and that goes back to Ephesians 2.10. So mm -hmm. God has made us right. to, to glorify him in those works, but those works don't save us. It is right. the work of Christ that saves us. That is the only thing that we can go back to, to say, I've been washed clean. I, I'm no longer unrighteous before God. Right. Christ has justified me. I stand in his presence fully free of the penalty of sin. And I can trust in that and I can rest in that.
Yes. And I think it does go back to this whole thing of when you're talking about the Pharisees and um, with all due respect, I, I see a lot of that, um, you know, I want to say, yes. hello, kettle, you're black. Like, you know, <laughs> this, is know, the pot, this is the pot talking to you. You're black. Exactly. Uh, it, there's a lot of pharisaical tendencies in the charismatic movement. Not everybody. But right. when you start to hear these things, it's putting more burdens on people. Um, and it's ultimately drawing the attention back to you. Exactly. And what you're doing. The other thing that I kept coming to my mind, we were discussing this whole idea of the bride is when God told Hosea in chapter three, Mary Gomer, who is the prostitute, give yourself to her, love her only. Um, and what does she do? She runs away and is a prostitute again. And he brings her back again. And God's saying, I want you to know what it is like for me with Israel. This is what's happening. I love Israel. Israel's, you know, Israel's my bride, yet she is now going, you know, she's worshiping Baal. She is now off on other idols. You know, how long is this going to happen? But what's so amazing is that's another, um, what do they say? A shadow of what Christ does for us. Yeah. Because you know what? Once we're saved, we are saved and we are abiding in Christ. Do we sin? Yes, because we're still this side of heaven. But does God forgive? Yes. <laughs> he He embraces us again because he has bought us and he has made us his bride. He has given us the, he has given us the righteousness that we don't deserve because of what Jesus did. And I think it's so awesome to think about this Holy Week. You know, this, this is what Jesus did. This is this is what we embrace. And, um, without this would, we, we would not have life. Um, and anyway, I just, that whole scenario and that whole picture and imagery of Hosea, of, um, just bringing Gomer back and how God's saying, see, this is what I'm doing. I feel like sometimes that's my life. <laughs> not that I'm a prostitute, but you know, <laughs> I'm not, believe me. <laughs> and, and, and we all breathe a sigh of relief for you. <laughs> I'm so no, glad. I just, I'm so glad to hear that. Oh my goodness. But just like how I, I feel so undeserved, you know, I don't deserve this, which is yeah. true, which is why Christ did what he did. But it's very humbling because, um, absolutely. When, once you really grasp what, you know, of the salvation that's in how much you've been forgiven, it's, um, overwhelming. And, um, I, I, that's, I think probably you could agree. It's another reason why it gets us so angry when we see people adding to scripture and then putting more burdens on people's backs. You're warping scripture, which Galatians, you know, Paul says, if you add to it, you know, you're going to be accursed. And this is adding to scripture, you know, and, and, and he says, yeah, adding to the gospel or a different Christ. Well, you know what? A different gospel is a different gospel. I mean, if you add to scripture and say, well, like what Simmons was saying, 2000 years, he got it wrong. I had this revelation of what the bride really is. That's, um, uh, yeah, many red flags go up. So please, um, learn how to read the red flags. Yeah. I can't help, but when you just said that to think of, um, of hearing Lucifer saying, did God really say that yes. in the garden? Yes. And, and, uh, even second Corinthians, you'd mentioned about, uh, in, in us talking second Corinthians 11, he mm -hmm. talked about that Jesus was going to give birth to the second Eve. Yes. And I thought, what? <laughs> like this is, this is deceiving yes. people just like Paul warned about in second Corinthians 11 about, yes, you know, that, exactly. that, that he feared that they would be deceived like Eve was because yes. you're, it's just not enough. I mean, the simplicity of the gospel is beyond it's beyond my comprehension many times yeah. um to think I, I don't think oh look at me i think why me i mean right. now being out of this i think why me i mean i'm a mess yeah. i mean I, I fall short every single day and i'm reminded of of my need for for the lord every day mm -hmm. um but there's also that <clears throat> there's joy in that because i know that that i'm not alone that he's right. not left me alone and that he loves me um, because I'm one of his own. And that's, that's not because I look at myself and think more highly of myself. It's because I think more highly of him because yes. my view of him is far higher than it is of myself. And that's a big change from what it was when I was in this movement. I think that mm -hmm. God was far smaller 
in this movement. Yeah. And I thought I was some glorious <laughs> bride and having all these extra biblical <clears throat> revelations and visions and dreams and things. And I had made God small. Um, but that's not who he is. He's, he's far bigger than I can comprehend. And his gospel is more, um, more, it has holds more all to it than I can, than I can fully understand on this side of eternity. Yes. I wanted to play this last clip and I uh, just want you to listen to it for a couple of minutes. And I appreciate you all listening to us today, have this discussion, but I think you'll find this clip from Paul Washer, very insightful about the bride of Christ and um, why the analogy he's using is fitting today. I'm going to give you a harsh illustration. Imagine that, and I, I've given this so many places, but it's so important. I want to communicate this truth to you. Imagine that a great king, a great king, is going to go on a long journey, and he calls you as the steward to care for his bride, his bride that he loves more than, than, than everything, more than his kingdom. And he gives you a list, a kingly decree. This is what you're supposed to do with my bride. This is it. You do not add to this list. You do not take away from this list. This is the list. And the king looks at you with fire in his eyes. Because this is my bride. I use the illustration that oftentimes I would go into red zones in different places in Peru where the terrorists were supposedly in control or the military was kind of dangerous or things were going on. And my wife would want to go with me and I would say, no, 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 no. You're not going. Why? They pull me off the bus, push me around, do all kinds of things with me. Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. No big deal. One of those men lay a finger on my bride. It changes everything. That's my bride. That's my bride. So I would tell her, I don't want to get you in trouble and I don't want to get me killed. <laughs> and if I, being evil, could love my wife so that I would fight men, What kind of passion does Christ have for his bride? And so listen, preacher, this applies to missionaries, applies to all of us. So he, this king, has always delighted in his bride. Oh, she's beautiful, but she's, she's simple. No painted eyes. No need for rouge. A simple white, long, flowing, elegant dress that he gave her. And then he goes on a journey. But as he goes on that journey, he stays longer than everyone supposes. And you, as a wise steward, begin to realize that, well, the people are no longer interested in the king because they're no longer interested in his bride. She's old-fashioned. And so you drop a plan, and some of you have drawn up this plan. And some who will hear me through video have drawn up this plan. So you decide. You're going to change her dress. You're going to paint her face. You're going to restyle her hair. And you're going to march her before a bunch of carnal men like a prostitute in order to use her to draw them back to the king. And that's exactly what these church growth people are doing. This is exactly what's going on in America. And it's going on in the mission field. And it is wrong. And I want you to know on the day of judgment, do not fear for the atheist. Fear for the pastor and the missionary who decided that he must change the look of the bride of Christ in order to make her attractive to carnal men, to bring those carnal men back home. Fear. 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 It should be a daily exercise. Oh, Lord, increase my fear of thee. You should look out from that pulpit at that bride of Christ that you're pastoring, that you're teaching, and realize this, this thing, this, these people, they belong to him. I will teach them only what the king has told me to teach. I will not add a word to it. I will not take a word away from it. I will treat her as she ought to be treated. I will obey the commands. And I will do so trembling. Know that if I have done it and I have submitted to his decrees, I have done nothing special. I have only obeyed as I should have. I think I mentioned to you before about this, Paulette, with this clip is he was describing about the, the steward 
yes redressing the bride and yes. and to to appeal to people because people were losing interest in the bride and honestly i think that's what's happening today in the mm -hmm. in this particular movement is that there has to be something of appeal to to it otherwise the bride is uh the church is just boring yeah or legalistic yeah um religious that they believe in god the father the God, the son and God, the holy Bible is what right. some will say about right. It, right. those of us who make who take a stand for this. Yes. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? That's very true. As a matter of fact, I think what let us, what opened the door for us to go down that path, my husband and myself was, I was concerned that what if, what if revival happened and I missed it? I missed it. I, I don't want to miss it. I want everything that God has for me. Well, there was no parameters with that, but, but then it was all me. What am I going to miss? I don't want to miss it. I want everything God has for me right here. <laughs> yeah. Everything, you know, and, and that's where we, that's, I think where did God really say, you know, did God really say that was enough? Did God really say, and what else, you know, what if it, I remember saying, I went to a woman's called a convocation. That was my in introduction to it. Weekend retreat. And I remember coming back and I remember saying to our pastor's wife, because we were going to a conservative evangelical free church. And I said, she's like, well, how was it? And I said, I said, well, what if, what if revival happens only it's happening in a way that we've never seen before and it's out of the box. We're going to miss it. <laughs> what the does that mean? That means extra biblical stuff because you're bored with it. It's not enough. It's not enough. And, and I just, I, I'm very pained about that. I am very pained about that. And I go back to scriptures where God says, you know, he works everything for good for those who he has called according to his purposes. And I hang on to those things because there are the times that I I'll repent again for everything that just brought us, helped bring us down that path, you know, um, because a lot of really bad things happened, you know, um, but praise God, he can redeem anything and he can, and he uses everything and it doesn't surprise him. And, uh, anyway, so yes, I agree with, with what you were saying, with what Paul Washer said, it's, you know, the church is boring. It's not relevant. It's, it's gotta be, it's gotta be more exciting. There's gotta be more. Yeah. I gotta say, uh, <laughs> all the years I've spent, in this and then uh now being on the other side of it uh i can't imagine more peace um yeah even in, even in difficult times not that there's not difficulty um that everything's yeah. easy now but there's just it's so much better to have a, a proper biblical perspective on things and to yes. not feel like you have to be strong all the time i'm not a bride in combat boots you know i <laughs> I need God. Thank God we're not called to do that. And and it's a and in the moments of weakness and in difficulty and trials and suffering, it I those are in our lives to remind us of our need for him. Yeah. Um and so I think that that is so reassuring to know that and it takes that weight and that burden off of right. okay, I'm I'm not supposed to be like this. Like I am part of the bride or the body of Christ, but I'm not I'm not here to save the day right. uh, that, and you know what else? It's okay. that some of it's a mystery. Yes. You know what? We don't understand everything that God has. We aren't God. He's doing his best to describe things to us. You know, again, are you looking at, is it prescriptive or is it just descriptive? You know, he's trying to use things that we understand earthly things, things that he's created so that we can get an understanding of what he's talking about even in revelation when they talk about the bride and you'll read about that it's it's very descriptive trying to explain you know what it looks like and who they are and, and it is the church we are the church but please that's one thing i would really encourage people to understand not in a mystical sense but when paul said this is a mystery it is a mystery there are some things that we just it's okay we don't have to have an answer to the important things we have answers to. And when we start digging around out of scripture to get answers, then we've just opened the door for deception to just roll right in. Amen. Well, this has been a great discussion and I really yes, appreciate you, you being on here today. And I hope that this is helpful 
And thank you I all for joining today. And um, I'm going to have a link to uh, Stephen Paulette's YouTube channel so you can watch their content and you can reach out to them. And um, thank you for joining us today. And I look forward to being with you when I cover another topic. But until that time comes, be blessed today by the truth of God's word. Thanks for joining me on this podcast. If you would like to connect with me, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram. You can also email me at dawn at lovesubscribe.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I hope you'll consider leaving a five-star review and that you'll even share it with others who may benefit from the information provided. If you also like reading, you can subscribe to my blog at lovesubscribe.com, where I release weekly blogs that correlate with the podcast episodes. I've enjoyed our time together today, and I look forward to our next time together as we dive into biblical truths, current topics, and where we grow in loving the Word and loving the one who is the Word, Jesus Christ. Blessings to you.